Um, good, good afternoon, um, colleagues um, and students and all of you who have joined us this, this afternoon. Um, I'm Ellen Tice and I'm the Senior Director of the Library and Information Service. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to welcome you this afternoon uh, to the launch of Library Research Week 2020, our eighth Library Research Week at Stellenbosch University. Also a warm and a special welcome to Professor Eugene Kluter, the Vice Rector Research, Innovation and Postgraduate Studies under which um, the Library and Information Services uh, resorts. And also our guest, our guest speaker this afternoon, Dr. Balandiwe Sishi. So as uh, some of you who have attended Library Research Week in the past know, we used to have that um, with, uh, in the library. And since the last two years, we also had it at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences. Some of our sessions there were also repeated uh, also to give them an opportunity to participate. And of course, because of the events this year, we wanted to keep the tradition going with Library Research Week. And um, although it's unfortunate because of the circumstances and how it has affected us, we are very pleased that we're able to still present Library Research Week virtually this, this year for the first time, of course. And we were really excited to see um, how this um, format will work. We can already see a big difference just in terms of the number of registrations uh, and um, people who have indicated that they will attend this afternoon. So um, we've already heard we have more than 1,200 um, uh, registrations, which is about which is quadruple what we normally get uh, for the whole week during Library Research Week. So um, as you as you know that the overall aim of, of our Library Research Week is to equip our master's PhD students and also young researchers with practical knowledge of research essentials. Um, the sessions are however, also of such a nature that anybody who is interested can join, learn and contribute to our discussions. Um, I hope I'm not taking much of what Professor Kluter is going to say, but I know normally he's, he says um, other things, so I think I'm, I'm still safe. Um, the theme of this year is, is going for research gold. Um, and some of you may have wondered about it. The original date of the research week for this year was actually set for the 27th to the 31st of July, which was going to coincide with the 2020 Olympic Games. But with COVID-19, as we know, everything had changed and we had to move then to this new date. And since plenty of time has already been put into the planning and preparation, we decided to stick with the original team theme, even though the Olympics have been cancelled. So we still have our own Olympics here um, in, in South Africa and at Stellenbosch University today. So the program for the, for the week had been organised around the overall theme with sub themes. And we're starting uh, today um, with the first place and the winner already uh, going for gold. Um, and that is what Dr. Sishi will bring for us today. And then tomorrow we have Get Ready. On the 26th, we will have Get Set. And on the 27th, we will have Stay on Track. And on, 20, on the 28th of August, on Friday, we will be crossing the finish line. So um, it gives me now then further great language. Um, I mean, a great pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Kluter, uh, the Vice Director of Research, to make a few remarks about uh, Library Research Week and, of course, you know, the, uh, the contribution that the library is making at Stellenbosch University towards uh, all its academic endeavours. Thank you, Professor Kluter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ellen. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. A warm welcome to all of you. It really is a pleasure to be here this afternoon and to welcome you to the Research Week. Uh, thank you very much, Ellen, for organising this and pushing through uh, these difficult times. Uh, and I'm very pleased to hear that there are so many attendees uh, during uh, this week. Uh, also, a warm word of welcome to Dr. Sishi, who's going to talk to us just now. I'm really looking forward to what she's got to say. Um, from what I can gather, it is the journey uh, towards a, a PhD uh, through her eyes. Um, and I have a lot of uh, 
understanding for that, uh, I've been in the fortunate position to have uh, promoted in excess of 110 masters and PhD students. So I've seen it at least through 110 different eyes and journeys. And the fascinating thing here is that there is no single uh, cut out journey. In it. Everyone's journey uh, is different. But if you start looking at these journeys, there are definitely some common trends uh, that emerge. Uh, you go through very uh, periods of very excited, uh, starting off with a bang. Uh, then you start doing your literature review, you start doing your experiments. And in the biological sciences, which I hail from, uh, you often face failure. Those experiments just don't work. Uh, and uh, or you get a very good result the first time you do the experiment and then you cannot repeat the experiment. But there are many, many different things. The challenges that you face uh, also uh, in your private capacity, where you live, what access you have to information, all of that makes a difference. The one thing that I can say, having been responsible for the library over the past eight years and also as the dean of science before that, uh, interacting uh, with the library is that it is a world-class library and information service and a world-class resource for our researchers, uh, our, our students and staff uh, at Stellenbosch University. Uh, and despite uh, all of the challenges to me that we had uh, last time that we faced a major challenge like this, was when uh, in 2008, 2009, uh, when we went into that recession economically into uh, worldwide. And now, of course, we face uh, an even uh, more pressing challenge. Uh, we can't be with one another and we have to interact uh, using Teams and Zoom and all kinds uh, of methods. The one thing that I do think is important here, that a lesson that I have learned over the past hundred odd days is that when we have meetings like uh, seminars, webinars, uh, discussions, they are very well attended. They are far better attended normally than uh, having them on campus. And uh, we need to find out why that is. Uh, perhaps it's because it's so easy to move from one location to the other. You can be in London in the one minute and in the next minute you can actually be back in Stellenbosch. So uh, it's incredible what technology uh, is enabling us to do. But during this time, um, the library and information service has been providing uh, the uh, consultations and the service as if nothing changed. And I want to thank you for that very much, Ellen. Uh, you and your team, everyone in the library, uh, uh, so that uh, we can in fact go on with our research um, in very much sort of an interrupted way. Uh, we've had great discussions, we've gone online, it's been successful, the emergency online teaching has been successful, but I think the online research has been equally successful and many of our students on our back uh, on campus, those especially that need laboratories to do their research um, and that need access to books that they need to fetch from the library where there's no. So it's, it's been tough. Uh, but I think we've been very innovative in everything that we have done uh, as a university. Uh, all of our staff and students have collaborated. It's been great uh, and I truly can look forward uh, as we go uh, into the future about a new uh, world of work. Um, it's great to have discussions with people and with the postdocs and so on on how they see things and a lot of things have changed. So with those few words, uh, I'm looking forward to the presentation. Uh, thank you for everyone participating in this research week and for everyone um, that is attending. I can convince you that looking at the program that you will get a huge amount of value for the time uh, that you are going to spend uh, in terms of your PhD studies. And uh, with those few words, over to you, uh, program director, and good luck, uh, Dr. Sishi. <laughs> Thank you. I am now sharing my slides. I don't know if everybody can see. I can see them. Thank you very much. Yes. OK, just before you start, um, okay. um, if, if I um, also would like just to, to introduce you. Um, so it's also I'm delighted to introduce now Dr. Balendiwe Sishi. 
um, to you, who, as I said, is our guest speaker this afternoon. She's mainly known as Bali to her pre peers, was born in the Windus city of Port Elizabeth. She grew up and completed her schooling in Peter Maritzburg and then relocated to the Western Cape to further her studies at Stellenbosch University. She completed her PhD in Physiological Sciences in 2012 and is currently a senior lecturer at the Department of Physiological Sciences at Stellenbosch University. Her research interests lie in the field of cardio-oncology, where she investigates how chemotherapeutic agents such as doxorubicin injure the heart while killing cancerous cells using different mechanisms. Bali has always been fascinated about the functioning of the human body, not only when it functions but well, but also during disease. How minute cells from different organs, which forms part of different systems, communicate with one another in a holistic manner to relay important information to bring about a particular function or response. A favorite organ is the heart, for without it, we can survive for very long. She loves reading, spending time with family and friends, and enjoys a glass or two of red or wet or white wine, depending on the weather. Thank you for making yourself available this afternoon, and we look forward to listening to you. Thank you, Ellen, for that um, introduction. I hope everybody can hear me at the moment. If anybody can just say yes. Uh, we can hear you. Um, I, ah. Unfortunately, the audience can't respond. Yeah. Oh, OK. Thank you, <laughs> Gertzna. All right. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and a happy Women's Month to all the ladies in attendance. As introduced, I am Bali Sishi, and if you are anything like my undergraduates, I am also known as Dr. Sushi. I trust that you are all well, and I thank you for attending this afternoon's session. I must say, based on the number of attendees, I feel quite intimidated, not because you're listening to me, but rather because I cannot see any of your faces and your facial expressions, but that's okay. We need to save as much bandwidth as possible. I also want to say thank you to the organizers for inviting me to this event. And based on the program and activities for the week, I wish that I too was still a student as back then. We did not have any of this, or at least I was not aware of. So you are very fortunate. Now this entire week is in essence dedicated to you and it is all about you and your needs as postgraduate students. And while I may be shedding my journey, experiences and challenges, etc., I would also like to give you an opportunity to pose one or two questions that you may have at the very end of this talk. Now, I'm not a very formal speaker, so at this point in time, I just want to say sit back, relax and chill to use young people's lingo. Like everybody else, my journey started many, many moons ago when an egg was fertilized. And nine months later, I rocked up. I went through the typical phases of growth being childhood, teenage years, adolescence, and of course, adulthood. But when it came to choosing an institution to further my studies, all I knew at that time was that I wanted to be based in the Western Cape and I wanted to become a medical doctor like my mother because that is the only doctor type that I knew at that time. When my father heard about this, he asked what about my profession? He was a lawyer and I said, I don't want to become a professional liar. He canned himself and just said, OK. Now, with that being said, I mean, no disrespect to those in the audience that are pursuing their postgraduate studies in law. Out of all the institutions that I did apply for, it was only Stellenbosch University, in fact, that responded with acceptance. And that is how I ended up at this institution. Now, you'll note that I was not accepted for the degree path that I wanted, but such is life. 
you do not always get what you want, but for the most part, you get what you need, even though you don't realize it at the time. And therefore, it is absolutely crucial to have a plan B or even a plan C, because clearly in my case, my plan B worked out so much better than my plan A. If I can be frank at this point in time, I did not want to come to this institution for the simple reason of its reputation and that, that Stellenbosch was an arts based institution and though I had expressed my feelings to my parents, they indicated to me that if I don't try, then I have no idea what the outcome will be. My response was that, okay, fine, I'll give it a year and then I want to move irrespective of what happens. Although the language issue was what I had expressed to my parents, it was the fear of failure that resonated in me the most because I knew what they had to sacrifice to get me to this institution. Now, we all might face the fear of failure during a particular process or even after it's complete. And you might wonder if you're good enough or if you're anything like me, you simply start asking yourself maddening questions. What if this? What if that? What if I fail? What if I don't settle and adapt into this new and foreign environment? What if the courses and exams are just too difficult? In order to overcome these problems, it is important to remember that we are only given a few decades on this planet and what you make out of them is essentially up to you. Yes, it's a difficult world and things are hardly perfect or work out exactly the same way we want them to be, but that's not the point. You can only do the best you can with what you have and that's enough. Well, I did fail and my undergraduate degree took me four years instead of three. Unfortunately, during my final, final year, my eldest brother passed and did not see me graduate. And that was a pity because not only was he proud of me, he was also super supportive. Now, because I was not ready for the working world and there was no pressure for my parents to find employment at the time, I decided to not only apply for medicine again, I also applied for honors. However, prior to doing that, I had been doing some shadow work at the Department of Physiological Sciences, considering that I, I had a hell of a lot of time on my hands because the subject that I, did, that I did fail was a second semester subject. Little did I know that I had begun my postgraduate honors degree, even though it was not official. I went through the various training protocols, what I can and cannot do in each lab. And then after all of that was done, I was then given a mini project to work on. But also this was to test my skills. I did just that at my own pace, even though I did not manage to analyze the results at the end. 2007 came and even though I did not meet the minimum requirements, I still managed to make the list for honors, but unfortunately not for medicine. And this is where I said, don't focus on the door that's closed, but rather on the one that's just opened. While the year was going very well for me, I was dealt another personal blow where I lost my favorite man in the world, and that was my father. I was crushed. I didn't even know whether I was coming or going. Eventually, I managed to dust myself off and keep it moving. When I came back from home, my supervisor, who is now my colleague, Professor Engelbreth, said you need to prepare a 10 minute presentation within a few weeks, because within a few weeks, we are going to go to Joburg for a conference and I entered you into a competition. I was thinking to myself, is this lady for real right now? She knows I've never presented to a wide audience other than with peers for group work and things. Fine, I did it. She said, great, we're ready to go. Mind you, I still had no concept of what a conference was and I had no idea what I was setting myself up for. 
day of the competition arrives. And for some reason, I decided to have a look at the program for the day. And I was like, OMG. What the hell was my name doing amongst MSCs, PhDs, and postdocs? I didn't even have time to absorb this information when she came to find me and said, let's go, it's time. And she was as cool as a cucumber. The presentation room was as big as the library's auditorium. And while the techs were busy strapping their microphones and things on me, I was saying to myself, girl, either you're going to sink right now or you're going to swim. I pulled out my best breaststroke and I swam like Penny Haynes, even if I could say so myself. Now, if you're anything like me, I do not know how to receive or accept compliments. I just say, okay, thank you. I then retreat and then hide. And it was only then did I realize and understand what my supervisor was trying to do. And that was to build my confidence. Though she knew I could do it, I certainly did not. And with that, I want to say, trust your supervisors because they know what it is that they are doing, even if we think they're out of their minds. I eventually, I eventually graduated top of my class, nothing big because at that time we were only seven of us in that class. And I dedicated then my honors degree to my father. By this time, my supervisor and I had a very good re working relationship. And she said that maybe I should consider doing my MSc. I said I would think about it, but something else was bothering me that I just could not get out of my mind. And that was the additional year that I took to finish my BSc and I needed to make up for it somehow. Now regret is a terrible, terrible feeling. And by now, you might all know how it feels. You know what they say, you'll end up regretting the things that you didn't do more than the things that you did. And this is why you should follow your dream and go after what you really want, because at the end of the day, it will be worth it. Now, traditionally, an MSc takes about two or more years, and I approached my supervisor and asked her, what the possibility was for me to complete my MSc in one year. She said it is possible while pointing to another student and completing the sentence. If he can do it, then why can't I? And this person she was pointing at was Professor Lewis, who served as my co-supervisor for my PhD. Now, I didn't tell my supervisor that I had applied for medicine for a third time. And I, once I got that we regret to inform you later, but now I was really getting used to the rejection. And I thought, here's my chance. I went back to her and I said, I'm here. What do you need me to do? In not so many words, she said, you need to be resilient. You need to be persistent and you need to have stamina because this is not a race, but a marathon even though it kind of was. The next day, we sat down, discussed the project, formulated a strategy, and off I went and got started. I did not go home for the holidays. I spent my weekends in the lab, and my days were long and seemed never ending. I must say that even though it was a lonely ride, I did not regret it one bit, because at the end of the day, I got my MSc within a year and I was elated. This degree was dedicated to my siblings. And since I'm the eldest in my family and having to lead by example, I wanted to also show them that if you want to accomplish something, then you need to put in the work, even though the road that you may have embarked on may seem lonely. Towards the end of 2008, I needed now to figure out what I was going to do next because I had not secured a bursary for myself for the following year and I knew that I was still not ready to find employment. I sat in my flat trying to figure out how I'm going to tell my mother 
and my family that I wanted to study some more. So eventually, I plucked up the courage and I called. And the first thing she asked me was, when am I coming home and when are you finishing? I said, soon, but I need to come back. She goes, come back for what? I thought you said you're done. I said, yes, I'm almost done, but I want to study some more. She goes, study what? You know your sister is coming there next year. What is it that you are not telling me? Do you have a boy there? Little did she know that indeed there was a boy, but that's not the point. And I would not dare reveal that to her. I said, I know things are tough right now, but I promise I will get her a bursary and I hung up the phone. I did not tell her that I had again applied for medicine. And by now, you know how that story ended up. So I moved on and registered for my PhD with the same supervisor. But this degree I wanted to do different. And I decided that I was going to be selfish. This degree was mine and mine alone. And since I did not manage to secure a bursary, I started to work in the library just to cover my monthly expenses because my family was then going to help me out and cover tuition and rent. I did not tell my supervisor that I worked part-time until she started noticing that I came to the lab just after 12 because my morning shift at the library ended at about 11.30. I told her that I didn't have a bursary and I needed to support myself somehow. She said, okay, and we didn't speak about it for months. Little did I know that behind the scenes, she was busy contacting various individuals within the faculty and the institution trying to help me get a bursary. It was only towards the end of the first year of my PhD did she manage to secure some funding for me. All she said to me was, fill in these forms and spend it wisely. I must say that bursary came at a very opportune time for me as I was really feeling the part-time working and still being a full-time student. I called home and I told my mom that I got a bursary. And until I graduate, she needn't worry about me. She must just focus on my sister who was enrolled at food sciences at Stellenbosch at the time. Even she too avoided the law. I honored my contract at the library until the end of the year, but I had to let it go because I, was, I fully wanted to focus on my studies. This was where my research enthusiasm really took over and I was immersed in it. I had a really interesting topic and as Ellen had indicated, I um, was in the field of cardio-oncology or as some people would prefer, onco-cardiology. Although this field encompasses both cardiology and oncology, I was struck at the reality that life is so unfair at times that an individual can take life-saving medication to treat one disease, in this case it was cancer, only to get another disease a few years later, which is heart failure, only as a result of the medication an individual took to treat a previous disease. So essentially, my job for my PhD was to figure out a way in, we, in which we could reduce these side effects in the heart without interfering with the efficacy or efficiency of the chemotherapeutic agent. Despite the highs and lows, ebbs and flows, the waxing and the waning of a PhD journey, I managed to finish at the end of 2011 and graduated in 2012. This was when I had my aha moment, when I finally listened to the universe. And that was realizing that the doctor that I've always wanted to be was in fact not for me. The journey that I took 
led me here, and this was academia. Looking back, I honestly don't think that I would be able to do what my mom does, especially now during COVID times, because those are the main patients that she is currently treating. Interestingly for me, the day that I defended my PhD thesis <laughs> was the very same day that I had my first formal job interview for an academic position. And luckily for me, the position that was available was at my department. What was weirdly strange that day, the same day that I had an interview, my supervisor, Professor Engelbrecht, was also up for a promotion. My co-supervisor, Professor Lewis, also had an interview the same day for a different um, position within the department. I was like, you know what? The universe works in mysterious ways and I'm not even going to try and understand it. At the end of the day, we all got positive news and that is in essence how I ended up in the position that I am today. I managed to publish all my postgraduate work, including my honors project. And with a few citations along the way, I guess that culminated into one of my research highlights. And that was being selected to attend the 68th Lindau Nobel Laureate meeting. This is an annual event where approximately 30 Nobel laureates, in my case, it was in 2018, there were 39 Nobel laureates that convened in Lindau, Germany to meet the next generation of leading scientists. I was one of 13 South African students from various universities and one of 600 in the world representing 84 countries. These if annual meetings are uh, to foster the exchange amongst leading young scientists of different generations, cultures and disciplines, but also to mingle and take selfies with the Nobel laureates in a non hierarchical kind of way. Even though these meetings consisted of a multitude of scientific sessions, the purpose of the meetings was not centered on the presentation of results, but rather the discussion of topics that are globally relevant to all scientists. Not only is this meeting the best scientific conference in the world, it is the largest congregation of Nobel laureates worldwide. So before I am close to concluding and before I end this lecture, I just want to share with you some take home messages, the recipe for a Nobel Prize, and then leave you with some unanswered questions for you to ponder upon. Well, the first message is that it's important to have good mentors because you cannot learn how to do good science by simply reading the literature. Now, I've mentioned my supervisor and co-supervisor, but I've also had other mentors. Um, I remember my very first um, year as a working individual, um, I was alerted to the early career program that the university had offered where you could choose your own um, mentor and they would guide you in terms of some of the things that you had difficulty um, with. So throughout the six years that I've been mentored, I had two. One mentor of mine was Professor um, Jacques van Rooyen and the other was Professor Doug Rawlings, who both have unfortunately um, passed. The second take home message is to find an important research topic that is not yet interesting to everybody else at this time. Otherwise, the big guys will get there before you. And right now, the mainstream topic is COVID. So 
I'm not saying stop your research now, but just bear it in mind. Accidental observations may be the most important ones. So don't ignore those research results that you were not expecting. Go ahead and grab your luck because it is possible that even though you did not expect it, it is in fact what is happening depending on your experimental approach or otherwise um, depending on your own um, research topic. Now, you don't have to be fancy here and you don't necessarily have to use or have the most fashionable or otherwise state of the art technology. Use whatever experimental approach that you have at your disposal to either prove or disprove your hypothesis, aims or otherwise um, objectives. It's not about being fancy, it's about proving what it is or you know, trying to find an answer for your research um, question. Science, at least for me, is exciting and therefore it should be a curiosity driven um, adventure. I know doing a literature review and going through the literature uh, can be kind of boring if I can say, but once you get into the lab and you do those experiments, at least for me, I find it extremely um, exciting trying to figure out new ways or different ways if something just doesn't work. And then last of the take home messages, never leave the bench. And for me, I do feel guilty because I have, but slowly but surely I'm working my way back there because this is where you get the most excitement which leads on from the take home message five because science is exciting and if you were one of those kids that your parents got very frustrated with because you were asking a lot of questions why when how what you know you should be in science now, moving on to the recipe for a Nobel laureate. Now, you'll probably be pleasantly surprised because all of these things, all of us, in fact, know. Maybe not one. You need ample research support. Now, I know we all struggle with this, and I had my fair share of struggles being a supervisor at this point in time. And this includes funding, research support for your students, and this also includes different types um, of resources that you may need in order for you to accomplish or complete um, your studies. So this is very, very important. The other thing is that there shouldn't be any visible bureaucracy that is hidden from the students by the study leader, supervisor, principal investigator, etc. This includes supplies, um, advanced equipment or um, various different types of technologies. And this is all related to the resources that one needs to be able to accomplish the um, research project at the end of the day. The third, which is very, very difficult, working in small research groups with an average of three. Now, I am well aware of this, that I don't know if there are any supervisors in the room or in the audience, that this is very difficult based on the pressure that we have as a country to produce a lot of PhDs within a year in order to catch up with the rest of the world because we are lagging. But I guess it is what it is. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. And I cannot emphasize it more than that. Collaborate with peers, with other individuals from just different research groups talk about your project, you know, discuss ideas, discuss research techniques, because you have no idea um, 
how valuable another individual is unless you start peaking, uh, speaking to them. So this doesn't necessarily have to be in your own immediate environment, but also within the surrounding um, environment, because I believe that we can learn a lot um, from one another and it doesn't have to necessarily be your own peers. It could be other um, supervisors, other research groups, not necessarily within your own institution either. Um, there are a lot of individuals working in a particular field. You just need to find um, those individuals. It isn't easy. I know I also struggle with it, but it is possible. Peer pressure, as we all know, is there and it is absolutely intense and that is something that we cannot avoid. You are only as good as your last peer review paper. Not only did one of my mentors say this to me, but I believe Prof. Kluter in many of the talks that I have attended where he has been a speaker has indicated this. And then the last but is that there should be no hierarchy. Again, I don't know how supervisors are going to feel about this, but um, students are as good as the supervisors and as good as the Nobel laureates as well. So my last slide is dedicated to some unanswered questions for all of you. I don't have the answers but each of you will have to decide for your own selves. Does my life path generalize? And based on my journey, I don't know. Maybe it does, maybe it doesn't. Number two, what does it take to become a scientist? Now I'm only speaking from my perspective as a physiologist. Does it take passion? Does it take persistence? Is it about being original or originality? Is it about being kind or kindness? Now it could be all of the above and probably more or none of the above. How should young scientists be encouraged? Is it through independent research or is this a collaborative effort? Is it about a research team? Or is it about an individual star within an individual team? Is universal fundamental research needed? Should scientists become entrepreneurs? I'm sure Prof. Kluta is smiling, saying yes, they should. And finally, are Nobel Prizes really that important? Those are the questions that I would leave you with. And with all of the above being said, I hope that you are ready. You are almost set. You just have to get through this week first. I believe that you will stay on track and ultimately cross the finish line. So instead of saying, go for research gold in 2020, as is the theme for this week's activities, I want to say go for research platinum. Thank you once again for your attention and I thank the organizers for their invitation. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, do Dr. C. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm sorry, I've got an echo. Wait, let's see. Um, okay, yes, it's better, a little bit. But, um, oh gosh, it, is, it has been so, so stimulating um, uh, to, to listen to you. And, um, and I'm sure Professor Kluter would like to say something, <laughs> but just before he do, um, and as we said, we do have some time uh, for, for some, some 
uh, some questions. So, so it's just that you know, there's just so so many things, and you know, I even you know have now become excited and maybe thinking, oh gosh, I can possibly still you know also pursue a PhD after listening to you. Um, I also think, um, well, I do hope, um, and as we've heard, I think there's opportunities for probably uh, a Nobel laureate from Stellenbosch <laughs> University soon. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but before we, we get some of the questions, I would like to, to hear Professor Kutu would like to comment. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Ellen. Just uh, very shortly, Dr. Shishi, well done. Uh, what a fantastic presentation and what an incredible journey. Congratulations again on your own personal achievements and for the inspiration that you are to so many of our young uh, budding scientists uh, at the university. Um, you truly uh, are an example of excellence, uh, but it, it takes more than excellence to get a, a PhD, as you know. You know, you talk about the tenacity there, uh, having to explain the difficult situation, the lonely road that you have to travel and so on. But once you have climbed that mountain and you get to the top and they cap you, it is like a huge relief. Uh, and you just, you know, it's like uh, you've, you've reached the top that like uh, President Mandela once said, you get to the top only to realize that there are more mountains to climb and that there are more tops that you have to reach. But at least it's a good start. Uh, the mountain you've climbed there is a very, very good start and you did extremely well. So thank you very much for the trouble for doing this presentation, uh, for uh, sharing uh, openly uh, your thoughts, and your feelings and so on. And I wish you good luck with your career here at Stellenbosch University. And I do have an expectation that you might win the Nobel Prize for us, whether it's important <laughs> or not, that we can debate at some other point. But for now, uh, the Nobel Prizes, they do count. So I'm counting on you. Well done. <laughs> no pressure. <laughs> Thank, thank you. Thank you very much. So we, we will give an opportunity for questions uh, from from the participants. So if Kurtner can uh, just open that on the system uh, so that they can pose their questions all right in the chat. Okay, yes, the uh, questions has been opened. Uh, so yeah, uh, you can post your questions there and I will relay them to Dr. Sishi. Okay. So, so maybe while, while we wait for some of the questions to, to come through, I was just, you know, very curious um, to uh, ask you maybe just to uh, elaborate a little bit more on, on your current research that, that you're doing. Um, and um, that in itself you know, is also so interesting because many of us in personal family, friends hear about this whole issue around medication and just interesting to hear, you know, that that is what um, was the thing that you wanted to focus on. Yeah, just just what what are the challenges with the, the, the research that, that you currently engaging in? OK, um, I'll try not be too scientific. Um, so basically, I am working with the chemotherapeutic um, agent known as doxorubicin. Um, it is also called the red devil. It is literally red and it is the devil. Um, and what happens is, and if this um, medication is a first line treatment, mainly for breast cancer patients, um, but it is also used to treat other different types of solid or hematological um, malignancies. The problem is that as effective as this drug is, it has very bad side effects, which can, take weeks, months, years, even decades after you've completed your chemotherapy to become evident. Um, and that's been the difficulty in the sense that we don't know face, because we all respond differently to, um, you know, medicines. And even though, God forbid that I have cancer and get treated with it, I may not necessarily succumb to, you know, cardiotoxicity, which is a side effect, whereas other individuals don't. So there are a lot of risk factors um, involved. For one, we've been um, within the field. It's difficult to, we don't have, or currently, 
there are no um, sensitive ways in which we can detect this type of thing until it's relatively um, too late. And we have no cure at the moment, other than, of course, a heart transplant. And we all know those are very, very um, rare. So basically what I try and do is to understand how the chemotherapeutic agent kills cancer cells, but also to understand how it causes these damaging effects in the heart. So without interfering with the way in which the drug works. Now, um, when I started, there were very few people working on this, but now um, through, you know, more and more patients coming into the, the, the clinics and presenting with these various signs and symptoms, it has become a, a clinical um, health priority. So what has since happened is that now patients that have cancer and are potentially at risk for cardiovascular disease, they are treated in a collaborative effort. So um, the oncologist has now got to meet the cardiologist because the cardiologist is not interested in the cancer, nor is the oncologist interested in the heart, but they have to work together for the benefit of the patients. So this field is, that's why this field is called cardio um, oncology, so that we manage to monitor patients, not just before therapy, it is during therapy and long after um, therapy as well. So there are still a hell of a lot of unknowns within this field, but um, working together and recent um, research coming out, um, trying to find ways in which we can not only detect it very early, but to find um, long lasting solutions in which we can prevent this um, from happening. It is a very good drug. It is very effective. And, we've, and considering the increase in the number of cancer survivors, um, the problem comes in a few years down the line when these patients now are starting, are starting to experience um, cardiovascular events as a result of the chemo that they've received. Thank you. I see okay, the yes. You go ahead, partner. You don't have yeah, to ask this one. All right. Yeah, here's an anonymous question. Uh, how did you manage feelings of insecurity, if any, on your academic journey, especially at PhD level? Um, I must say, friends, <laughs> you need support, I must say. But I must, um, to be frank, in that my supervisor was a very good person that I could talk to um, about this. Um, yes, I have had times where I did not feel as good as the others, um, but, you know, with subtle encouragement and, you know, exposing me to different kinds of people and meeting different groups and, you know, giving me the opportunities to go to national and international conferences, and the likes, it, it, you know, slowly but surely it became um, um, better. But I mean, it's a, I don't know, self struggle at times, but I think uh, for me, my supervisor was like uh, a good person where I could just vent to, if I could put it like that. All right, and here's a second question. Uh, you briefly talked about the low number of PhDs in South Africa. In your view, what do you think should be done to increase the number of PhDs in the country? <laughs> that is not an easy question to, to um, answer. I mean, I too have only, since starting my academic career in 2012, have only managed to graduate one PhD, and hopefully by the end of the year, I'll have my second. But... Um, <sighs> It's you need funding to do all of these things. And there are students that, you know, approach you nationally, even from across the board, um, wanting to take up PhD um, um, positions in the country. But if you don't have 
um, sufficient, you know, um, funding for them or even yourself to then run these projects then becomes um, an, uh, a big issue. Um, I'm not saying that there are we don't have students that we want to graduate, but each student is different and needs to be approached as an individual in order to be able to accomplish that. Um, so I think if if I speak for myself, I think funding for me is really um, um, kind of the problem. If I could put it like that, it's not just about the research funding. You also need you know, if your student cannot manage to apply or didn't manage to get a bursary of funding to keep themselves going, then there's no way you'll be able to, or it will just take longer, I think. Yeah. Could I, could I also ask Professor Sluter if you would like to add something to that quiz, those comments? Yeah, it's, it's, I think it, it really is a, uh, a, a matter of funding. Uh, we are very much underrepresented, and if we compare the number of PhDs per thousand of people uh, across the world, we are not doing that well. Um, so, but it's, it's you know the, the first problem is funding, the second problem is funding, and the third problem is funding. I do think that we have great people uh, that PhDs. And we see that, you know, we have 4,700 700 master students, uh, approximately 1,700 PhD students at Stellenbosch Universities, which is a large number. Uh, and we graduate every year record numbers of PhDs as well in the order of 360. Uh, but they need bursaries and it's a tough road, you know, to, to work, uh, to, to, to live for three years on a scholarship, a PhD scholarship and not have any other income and people expect you to move the world at the same time. Uh, it's not an easy call. This is also irrespective of whether you have money or not. And uh, this is why less than 1% of the world population end up uh, with a PhD. It is a massive distinction uh, to obtain a PhD. I mean, we are used to it at universities that PR PhDs are just all over the show. You, you just, you know, you go into the department, everyone has a PhD and 240 professors and so on, but you go out of the university and you get into industry and they become as scarce as hen's teeth, actually. Uh, so you've got to have a certain tenacity. You've got to have a huge motivation. Uh, you need funding. You need good supervision. You need internal drive. You need creative thinking. You need entrepreneurship. And this is why the PhD is such an important um, degree because it's far more indicating to the outside world that you are technically competent for what you do, but you have at least 20 other attributes which are at a very high level. And very often people get employed for the 20 other attributes and not necessarily for the technical knowledge uh, that uh, students have. So we have people with uh, PhDs uh, in theoretical physics working in the banking industry, for instance. Uh, or with biology degrees and they work in the pharmaceutical industries and so on. And, and it's purely because of the attributes that come along with graduating uh, with a, a PhD degree. But it's tough and uh, it's a long road since you start. You heard that from uh, Dr. Sishi just now. Well, once you start, you're in it for nine years. I found it extremely difficult myself. Uh, to continue, to be quite honest. My friends were all driving company cars. They were buying their first homes. I was still driving an old battered out vehicle, battling to pay my bachelor apartment. Uh, but the safe to say that uh, I've, I've, I've uh, done as, as well as most of them and surpassed many of them uh, career wise. So it was worth, worth the effort uh, and worth the, uh, the tenacity. So, Ellen, thanks for that, and thank you for the opportunity to comment. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't see any further questions. So, and uh, that uh, brings us uh, towards the, the end of our session um, and the launch uh, of Research Week. Now, normally we would have had some wine um, and, <laughs> and some snacks. Uh, please, uh, you know, you can have it, um, you know, and you, we, we will refund you to later stage. <laughs> so, um, 
So I just want to say once again, um, you know, a vote of thanks firstly to Professor Kluter, um, who had made the time. Um, and um, it's the first time that he actually stayed the whole session. So I think it's great, as he said, also, you know, having this, this format. Uh, thank you very much. And he's actually on, on leave today um, that he made himself available and being able to participate um, in this uh, for, for the whole session. Secondly, to Dr. Sishi. Again, I didn't realize that um, that she worked um, as a student assistant um, in, in the library, but I'm so pleased to hear, yes, it looks like we've made a small contribution <laughs> <laughs> to her journey, her successful journey. Um, and, um, and, and we were really pleased uh, to have had you with us. It has really been stimulating and inspirational. So thank you very much uh, also for, for your time. And then lastly, I would like uh, well, second, lastly, the steering committee um, uh, under the leadership of Marlene Hendricks um, and the whole team uh, who have been able to work very hard in creating and making sure that we can have this um, uh, research with this, this, this year. And then also lastly to the participants, I hope that you all uh, have find that, uh, that you will find the rest of the week as inspirational and stimulating as Dr. Sishi's talk and that you can also benefit from the knowledge and experiences that our other presenters during the during the week will share with you. So thank you once again to everybody and I wish you all all well. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you everyone. Thank you. Have a nice evening. You too. Bye. Bye. Bye.